It's great to see each of you here today. You made it on time. <laughs> Even though the time changed, you're here. Awesome. Uh, I always do this little survey. It's fascinating to me. How many of you like this time period that we just fell back into? How many of y'all like that time? All right. Yeah, that, that's what I personally like. How many of you like to spring forward and you like more daylight? How many of y'all like that time? Oh, that's, it's, a, it's a nice mix. How many of you wish they would just leave it alone? <laughs> Yes, even if it's just move it 30 minutes, right, and just have like a compromise, that just leave it alone. Well, today we're uh, in Revelation chapter 6. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. We'll be also having the verses printed out on your outline, and we'll put them on the screen behind you. Uh, we're in the book of Revelation, and so we're going to put up the bookshelf as a reminder that we're going through all 66 books in five years, and we find ourselves down there on that bottom shelf, the last book, book number 66, written by John on the island of Patmos. And the book of Revelation is fascinating because it has 404 verses, but it has 500 references to the other Old Testament books. So it's kind of good that we've been going through the whole Bible. That way we can kind of see some of the things that are mentioned, and we see them again in Revelation. Revelation is prophetic, like about a fourth of the books of the Bible. So how many of you know that God wants us to know about future events? Or we wouldn't have put so much prophetic material in there. So that whole middle section just about, there is, uh, we got major prophets and minor prophets, a lot of books of prophecy. And so today, Revelation is that book. It's also what's called apocalyptic, which means that it has symbolism, and it's about end time events. So we're in chapter 6 today, and I must warn you, this is one of the toughest sections of Scripture to deal with. I mean, you could find yourself easily getting depressed, uh, easily thinking, oh gosh, this is just a lot. And it is. And it is. This, is. this is hard. I have struggled with this, and I didn't include all of the tribulation material in here because it is. It's just overwhelming. Uh, so anyway, we're, we're looking at that here in chapter 6, chapters 8 and 9, and then chapter 15 deals with the tribulation. Uh, we're also, as a church, we're reading along. So we'll talk about this today in the message. The groups will also talk about that. And then we have our reading plan, and so you can find Upwards Church, and we'll invite you to the reading plan. So every single day, we have a devotional and a reading that comes out of here. And so every day, we have an opportunity to continue to dive in, to dissect it, understand it, deal with it, see the comments of other people. So this week's readings will be chapters 6, 7, 8, and 9. All this week, we're doing those chapters. So that's another opportunity for us. Let me get us thinking about today's message. How many of you have heard of the following movies? Uh, Hunger Games. How many of y'all like the, the Hunger Games? Any of you like Hunger Games? Uh, Terminator series. Any of y'all like Terminator? Uh, Avengers. Anybody like the Avengers? All right. We've got some good fans. How about The Day After Tomorrow, uh, 2012? I Am Legend. How many of y'all like I Am Legend? Uh, the Book of Eli. Uh, Independence Day, War of the Worlds, War War Z. How many of you like zombies? Walking Dead, any Walking Dead fans in here? Okay, I'm, I love Walking Dead. And, and even the spinoffs, that those, are, those are fun for me. So what I've been listing here is what's called apocalyptic genre within Hollywood. It's one of the biggest money makers. If you think about all those movies, how much money those have made, Billions, 50 to 60 billion of that genre. The genre is so big that they divided it up into apocalyptic and then what's called post apocalyptic. So, Hunger Games is considered post apocalyptic, whatever, you know, however they figure that out. And then uh, you have um, <clears throat> uh, even zombie apocalyptic movies, World War Z and stuff like that. So this is something that's a part of our, I would call it our psyche. This is something that we would, uh, we're interested in, and we pay money for that. And, and this reminds me of what it says in Ecclesiastes 3.11, is that God has appointed the times, and he's also planted eternity in the heart of all people. That God's divine purposes are like deeply planted within us, and we all have this feeling that we know that there is a God, and that we know that God judges sin, right? How many of you are looking for justice in the world? It's not fair. It's not fair. And so we know that there is a God, if we're a believer, and that he's going to make things right. And so today's uh, topic or today's message, we're looking at these apocalyptic events. How many of you have heard of the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Have you all heard of that? We are actually looking at that 
today. So this is symbolic, but it's also a picture of coming reality. All right. <clears throat> Let me pray before we get into our word today. <clears throat> Would you join me in prayer? <clears throat> Father, thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you so much for each person that's here, those that will be watching online or on YouTube later. Lord, we're grateful to come and to sing to you. We're grateful to open your word and have it speak to our hearts. Lord, thank you for each of those who took the time <clears throat> excuse me, to be here. Thank you for what you're going to say in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me <clears throat> do a quick review of Revelation. Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm going to cough. <clears throat> there we go. All right. In chapter 1, John is on the island of Patmos, and he sees this wonderful vision of Jesus Christ, eyes of fire. It looked like he was looking at the sun. It was incredible. Uh, if, if you have a picture of Jesus, you want to read Revelation 1 and get a better picture of Jesus. It's incredible what we see in Revelation 1. In Revelation 1, he gives us the outline of the book. In chapter 1, verse 19, he says, write down what uh, has been, and so that was his vision of Jesus. Write down what's happening now, which is what is happening in chapters 2 and 3 with the churches, because they were happening in that time. And then he says, write down what will be, or these future events. And so he's pointing to past, present, and future. And when we get to chapter 4, which we were in last week, we see that this future event starts. And so he's telling us about the future. So chapters 4 on through the book are these future events. Last week we saw John was uh, taken up to heaven, and he was observing all that he saw in heaven. And so today, we're dealing with what's called the tribulation. And the tribulation is spoken of about 60 times in the scripture. The, the tribulation is defined as the worst things that could ever happen to the earth. It's the worst things the earth has ever been through. And if you do a Google search on uh, the world's worst tragedies, things like World War I will come up. World War II, the Holocaust, the transatlantic uh, slave trade. These are all horrific things that took lots of lives. But what we're going to see today in, in, in these chapters is even worse, if, if, if it's possible. I mean, it's hard to wrap our mind around that kind of damage and destruction. But this is what the Bible does. The Bible warns us of these terrible times that are coming. And we're warned for a couple reasons. Number one, we're warned so that we're aware of it. How many of you like to know things before they're going to happen and that you can be aware of this is what's going to happen? And so it's not a mystery. He's telling us these things will happen. And if you're a believer, I think that these things can be encouraging to you to realize uh, what God is doing and the fact that he is a savior for us. How many of you, you don't want to go through the tribulation period? Would you raise your hand if you don't want to go through? Okay, that should be most of us. Who wants to have all these problems and death and destruction all around you? So we have the promises. There's what we call the rapture. And let me just read to you Revelation chapter 3, verse 10 where uh, Jesus says to uh, one of the churches that he's talking to, Revelation 3.10, he says, Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you, or I will keep you from the hour of great time of testing and tribulation that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to the world. So Jesus says, I'm going to keep you, I'm going to take you from that before this whole time of testing that affects the whole world. So today we're going to look at this period of time that's going to affect the whole world in a tragic, tragic way. But Jesus says that uh, we will be taken from that. So in chapters 4, we saw that John's in heaven. He's taken from the earth. He's to the heaven. And then we see in chapter 5 that there's this great scroll that God the Father is holding on the throne and has seven seals. And the scroll is big and it has writing on both sides. This is the title deed to the earth. John's crying because the question is asked, well, who can open the scroll? And no one, he doesn't think anyone can open it. So he's crying. And they're like, no, 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 don't cry. One of the elders says, Jesus. Jesus can open the scroll. He's the one who is worthy. So as we were talking about these apocalyptic movies before, all these apocalyptic movies will have like a hero or a savior figure, right? 
Like in Hunger Games, Katniss. In Avengers, it's Thor or Hulk. Well, in, in, in our world, is Jesus Christ. He is the Savior. He is our hero. And so as we have these movies, they, they're, they're pointing us to some deeper truths. So yes, there are tough times coming, and yes, there is a Savior who can deliver us from these things. So let's dive into these tribulation judgments. Also, I want you to be aware of, too, that when we're in chapters 4 through chapter 22, there's something very interesting that's taking place. In chapters 1 through 3, the word church is used 29 times. 29 times the word church is used. And then from chapters 4 all the way to 22, you don't see church at all. But there's a lot about Israel in chapters 4 through uh, 21. A lot about Israel. And so it's kind of like a shift that takes place. And so I want to share with you before we get into this, because you may be asking like I did, why the tribulation? Have you ever asked that? Why the tribulation? Why would God do that? What is the purpose of the tribulation? And so I just want to share with you just a little bit from one of the books. I've got a stack about this tile of different revelation books. This is one that I have recently. And uh, I want to thank Joe for you got to get getting this for me because this is actually written by a Jewish man by the name of Amir Safardi and uh, Safadi Safardi that doesn't sound right. <laughs> Sarfadi, yes, you've heard of him too. He he's he's great. If you get a chance to, to watch him on on YouTube or whatever, uh, I would I would highly recommend it. So he he grew up in in Israel. He he knows all about the Jewish people. You know, and he, and he's a believer in Jesus Christ. And so he he has this perspective of how there's that the overlap. And so what we want to understand here is that because he explains this, this is important for us to understand that there's a difference. How many of you know there's a difference between the church and and and, 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 and Israel, the people of God. There, there is a difference. So many times when it comes as, as, as human beings, we can be selfish or myopic. How many of you have uh, a sibling or you're a parent of several kids and you realize that each kid can have a way of looking out for themselves and not thinking of others? Have you seen that? That's what we do sometimes too. We think, oh, I'm, you know, God is great and he loves me and, and the church is wonderful. Well, no, God loves the whole world, doesn't he? God so loved the world. And yes, he loves the church, but, but he also loves Israel. And God's not finished with Israel, and you're going to definitely see that in this book of Revelation, how there's a shift from the church, now in heaven, to Israel on the earth. And just as a reminder, I think this is a great reminder of the church. So the church is translated ecclesia, which means called out ones. We've been called out of the world and the world system into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what the church is. We've been called out of the world to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We're called the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. And uh, so we have to be careful what's called replacement theology, meaning that the church has somehow replaced Israel. And what the, the truth is that both of them have a part. Both of them play a, a role. I, I love the fact that it says that as the church, we've been grafted on to the stump, which is Israel. And so even though there may have been some, some cutting and some pruning, uh, we still have all of our, I mean, Jesus is a Jewish savior. Uh, the books of the Bible are written by these Jewish people. And so uh, we, there's a connection to us. And so we see in Revelation, the church is taken away and now Israel's taken over. So we, we can't be replacement and think that we're replacing Israel because they're different. So he says this, membership into Israel is based on birth. Membership to the church is based on new birth. The focus of Israel is on Jerusalem. The focus of the church is on heaven. Um, Israel possesses the earthly hope of the land. The church possesses the heavenly hope of eternity. Israel began with Abraham. The church begins with Pentecost. So do you see the, the differences between the two? And so he says, here's why the tribulation must take place. And he says this, the tribulation must take place because it prepares Israel for her Messiah. 
As we look at Revelation, we're going to see that there's this guy called the Antichrist, and he's going to act like he's a Messiah, a savior figure, but he will let the people down, and the people will actually see that they've been scammed, and they will see the true Messiah. So the tribulation prepares Israel for its true Messiah. The, is, uh, the tribulation will bring an end to what's called the times of the Gentiles, which we saw in Daniel, the book of Daniel. Uh, there will be a great battle of Armageddon, and so the, the Gentiles that are trying to destroy Israel will themselves be destroyed. And then thirdly, which we probably all are aware of, that the tribulation will punish mankind for sin. So that's why the tribulation must take place. And today, when you came in, hopefully you received these communion elements because we'll be receiving communion today because we want to remember the fact that Christ took the punishment that we deserved upon himself. The judgment that we deserved, Christ took upon himself. And so we're going to see judgment, but we need to always remember that Christ took the judgment for us. And so that's why we worship Christ. That's why we remember what he has done. And so we'll be observing communion uh, at the end of the message. Let's go ahead and dive in. Verse 1, as I watch, the lamb broke open the first of the seven seals. We, we already talked about what the seals were. This is the title deed of the earth. He's opening the first seal. He sees a white horse standing there. Man, that sounds like good news, right? Every time you watch a Western, you know, the, the good guy always rides in on the white horse. Well, not so fast. The white horse is uh, carrying, the rider is carrying a bow and a crown was placed on his head and he rode out to win many battles and to gain the victory. So as you're in Revelation, you're going to notice that there's what's called the unholy trinity or the satanic trinity. So the satanic trinity is this. Just the, the devil is trying to reproduce on earth. Uh, he tries to be, so the dragon tries to be God. The antichrist tries to be Christ. And then the false prophet tries to be the Holy Spirit. So that's what's going on here. And so the Antichrist is riding out on the white horse because Jesus will ride out on a white horse in, in, in Revelation 19. Jesus is on the white horse with many crowns. The Antichrist comes out, comes wearing, riding the white horse with one crown and a bow. So that, that's a scene of deception. He, he, he seems like the good guy, but we will see that he's really the bad guy. He's a really bad guy. Now, the bow. This is also, it reminds us of what it says in Ephesians chapter 6. Take up the shield of faith so that you can do what? Extinguish the flaming arrows of the enemy. So who's firing the flaming arrows but the devil, the enemy? And this is what the bow signifies, that he's the one with the flaming arrows. Uh, the fiery darts. And he rode out and won many battles and gained the victory. So he will become a world leader. He's very deceptive. And we're not going to spend much time on him here because we'll have a whole chapter on him later in chapter 13. We'll talk about that satanic trinity later. But you have this guy appearing on the scene during this seven years. During seven years of tribulation, the Antichrist is on the scene now. And then here we have another horse appeared. A, you'll help me out, what's the next color horse? A red one. So red is the symbol in the Bible of death terrorism, destruction. So that's what red symbolizes. And so here's the red horse. When you think red, oh my gosh, you know, whoa, this is bad. He was given a great or a mighty or an overarching sword. Uh, there's a couple words for swords in the Greek. This one for sword is more of a short sword, a personal sword. It's like for close hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's for like... Uh, Killing someone up close, and so it's, it, it has to do with like this, this picture of, of people really struggling against one another. And so he's given this overarching sword to, to bring, uh, to take peace from the earth. And, and there was war and slaughter everywhere. So the idea that this is kind of like personal in nature, just think about your neighborhood. All of a sudden, if it had like gangs and the gangs of people were fighting against one another and you have all this struggle, you know, and states are fighting against each other. There's just constant conflict all around and it's interpersonal conflict. It's very, it's very close and, and, and very difficult to deal with during this time. 
And so with the, with the, the, the church taken out of the scene and now this, this deceptive antichrist and now the selfishness of people taking over, there's a lot of conflict that's going to be in the world uh, during this seven time. So there's no peace. There's war and slaughter everywhere. And if that's not bad enough, then you got the black horse holding a pair of scales in his hand. And he heard a voice among the four living beings saying, a loaf of bread or three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay. So what this means is that now you have food shortages, and what food is available is very expensive. And so because of all of the fighting and all of the struggle, people don't have time to make food, and so food becomes very costly. It's something to fight about, and it takes a whole day's wages just to feed one mouth. That's kind of what the picture is. And so you can imagine the struggle there would be. is like, if I have to have a whole day's wages just for one mouth, how am I going to feed my whole family? It becomes very challenging and very struggling during this time of the tribulation with food shortages, with uh, personal conflict taking place. Now, how many of you, like, when COVID was here, you saw problems like that? Any of y'all remember that during COVID? I remember going to the store and having to wait outside in a line. Uh, I remember seeing empty shelves. I remember thinking there's no toilet paper. And, oh, goodness, here comes a guy with a, with a cart from the back. He's got one package, you know, can I have it? You know, it, it was hard to even get the necessities. And that will be like that times and multiplied. How many of you saw people act uh, bad during COVID? I mean, their, their behavior was really bad. That This is what we're talking about. There's this interpersonal conflict. When Nikki and I were uh, on an anniversary trip, we went to Maine, and we, we got on a ferry. Uh, this was in 2020 in August, and we were taking the ferry ride from the mainland out to some island, and everyone had on their mask. That was kind of the policy. You know, you got to wear your mask. And so we're on this ferry, and the wind's blowing really hard, and the mask is nearly blowing off. And so anyway, and then there's these cars, and we were there as people, so you could go either way. And this guy started yelling at this lady in the car because she took her mask down. She's in a sealed car, and he's out on this ship with the wind blowing like crazy, and he's losing his mind because of this lady. And so those kinds of interpersonal conflict, <laughs> you know, get multiplied uh, during this time. And you could see how this could easily happen, right? Tensions, struggles, Lack, shortage, not, not a type of environment that you would want to live in. It would be very challenging when you have deception all around you, when you've got war, slaughter, neighborhood gangs, crimes on the rise. It's just a mess. And then the lamb broke the fourth seal, verse 7, and I saw a horse whose color was pale green. And its rider was named Death. Oh, boy. And his companion was the grave. Like Bonnie and Clyde. You got death and the grave riding out together. This is going to be fun. And they were given authority over one-fourth of the earth. And so some commentators believe that a fourth of the population on the earth at this time is going to die. So you can imagine if COVID took, what, millions of people, just add 10 times to that, and, and you might have an idea. So if there's 8 billion people on the planet, imagine losing 2 billion of them through these catastrophic events. So you have death in the grave, given authority over one-fourth of the earth to kill with the sword. Now you're talking about major conflicts, because the word for this sword means it's a big sword. So now you have these big battles taking place, and so there's like large-scale war. So you got small-scale warfare in the neighborhood. Now you have large-scale warfare among the nations... And so they were, they were able to kill with the sword. And then there's famine. So not only is the price of food high, but you can't even get food. And then, look, it says, and disease. You could also translate this pestilence. So maybe there's new strains of COVID or other things that get released during this time. And if that's not enough, wild animals. We're going to read about an earthquake here in a minute. Just imagine if all the zoos were emptied of their animals, and now you have lions roaming the streets. And so you tell your kids, kids, got to be careful, you know, uh, going over there to, to try to get some food because uh, there's a pack of wild dogs, or now there's wolves on the, the run, or now there's these bears that are running around, or, or there's this, you know, pride of lions that's over here. 
Can you imagine? So humanity's in this weakened state, and now even the animals are cashing in and trying to feed themselves off of this chaotic mess that's going on. Aren't you glad you won't be here during the tribulation? And then it says this, verse 12, I watched as the lamb opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. How many of you have ever been in an earthquake? Have you ever been in an earthquake? Yep, I have as well. When I went to Peru on a mission trip, I was in a hotel, and I was awakened during the middle of the night to the whole a place shaking. It's very terrifying, very scary. I don't know how you measure things on the Richter scale, but anytime the ground is shaking, that's a scary <laughs> time. And so you just imagine this earthquake. Now, some commentators think that this could relate to possibly a nuclear war or something like that. Uh, we don't know. It doesn't say that, but it does say that the earth is shaking. There's an earthquake. The sun becomes dark as a black cloth. So in other words, if there's like buildings that have fallen down, just imagine the rubble of the dust going up. Uh, imagine if there's like electrical fires or fires that break out and there's all this smoke that's in the sky. So you have like this catastrophic event and then now you can barely see because of all the smoke and pollutions that are in the air. So the moon becomes red as blood, then the stars fall out of the sky. It's like there's some kind of a meteor shower that's causing damage now. I mean, like hail that's very damaging, that's coming down. Uh, figs are falling from the trees, shaken by strong winds. The sky was rolled up like a scroll. All the mountains and islands were moved from their places. And so it could be that the earthquake was so bad that it moves things around, causing tsunamis and all kinds of problems from these quote, acts of God. So you have these acts of people. People are acting like crazy. The animals are acting crazy. Now it's acts of God that are now being involved. Can you imagine all the chaos that would be during just this short period of time? Oh, wow. What a time that will be. So that... Um, let me re finish off ch chapter 6 here. Then everyone... So that doesn't leave anyone out, does it? Everyone, meaning the most powerful, down to the, to the lowest, they're all hiding themselves in their bunkers, their caves, among the rocks, the mountains, and they cried out, fall on us. We'd, we'd rather die. They'd rather die than, than live through this. Uh, and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of of the Lamb. And so now they're beginning to acknowledge maybe God's involved in this somehow. And, uh, and we find ourselves in a lot of trouble here. So there's maybe a little bit of an awakening that's taking place that we'll look at here in a second. So that's chapter six. That's pretty brutal. That's pretty hardcore. Chapter seven gives us a little bit of an interlude. We'll look at this next week. There's actually, God is at work in people's lives during this time. Isn't that amazing? And so there's an incredible uh, amount of people that are turning to the Lord during this time as well. We'll see in chapter 7 that there's like a great uh, bunch of people around the throne of God. And, uh, and, and these are people that are what's called tribulation saints. And so they're still witnesses, witnessing this taking place in, on the earth. And there's still people that are coming to God. But there's a lot of people that don't come to God. So what I want to encourage you is that um, make sure that you're not here during the tribulation. And here's what Jesus says. Just, I like how Jesus always comes in and, and explains some things. This is what Jesus said. I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter uh, 17, beginning with verse 26. And he says this. He says, when the Son of Man comes, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days, people were uh, enjoying themselves and enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time that Noah entered into his boat and the flood came and destroyed them. So how many of you, if you remember in Genesis 6 where it talks about Noah's day, it says that everyone's thoughts and actions were continually evil. How many of you feel like we're living in Noah's day now where there's continual thoughts and practices of evil all around us? So Jesus says that the end will be like it was in the days of Noah. Everyone's just kind of going along business as usual. Noah looked like a complete idiot building a boat and uh, he's being ridiculed, and then he looks like a genius when he gets in the boat, and all of a sudden, destruction comes. 
So we have an opportunity to look like you know, a fool now, but a genius when all this stuff is taking place. He also, Jesus also says this. He says, and, 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 and the world will be as it was in the days of Lot. People went about their daily business, and they were eating and drinking and buying and selling, uh, building and farming, up until the morning that Lot left Sodom. Then fire and sulfur rained down upon them all. And if you read back to this event with Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah was a very rough place. Very rough. A lot of bad things were going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. And the angel said, okay, when you get safely out of town, when you get where you need to be, then the judgment is going to come. And so God took his righteous and put them on the ark. God took Lot and his family and put them in a safe place. And then down came this time of judgment. Here's also what Jesus says. He says, uh, that night... Two people will be asleep in their bed. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be at work. One's grinding. The other one, one is taken and one will be left. Now, that's an interesting way to think about that. He's like, all of a sudden this happens in a moment. It happens quickly. One's taken, one's left. The word taken is the same word that's used in uh, John 14. John 14, beautiful passage. It says, do not let your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again. I'm going to receive you to myself. Now, that word receive is the same Greek word that's used by uh, taking that person. That The word take or receive is the same idea. Jesus is going to come and he's going to receive those that belong to him. And then on that day, that day when he comes, the destruction follows. So we have a choice. Do you want to be taken and be with the Lord or do you want to be left behind? It's a choice that we have. So I want to encourage us to make sure that we are right with the Lord Jesus Christ. So point number one, tribulation will be filled with death and destruction. You don't want to be here. And so this is a great opportunity for us, even though this is a hard message, to be praying for people that don't know the Lord yet, to be sharing our faith with people that don't know the Lord yet. That's why we're here as a church. We're here as light. We're the lampstand. We're giving light to our community. That's why we'll be there at Old Town, passing out the balloons and the water, inviting people to come to church. Why do we invite them to come to church? Just so they can make friends? No, so that they can know Jesus. That's why we do what we do. And then, so Joe will be up here in the front, and he'll be available to pray. If you have someone that you're sharing your faith with, someone that you know they're not living the way they need to be living, and you worry about them being left behind, Joe will be here, and and we can pray for people. You don't want to be here. Let's go on to the next set, because what you have is this tragic set of circumstances. you got seven seals that are open. You have seven trumpets that are blown, and you have seven bowls of wrath that are poured out. And we're not even going to look at the seven bowls of wrath, because I think you're going to get the idea from these two sets of seven. Seven is that number of completion, and so a complete judgment upon all of the world. Here we are now picking this up in chapter 8, verse 6. Then seven angels with seven trumpets prepared to blow their mighty blast. The first angel blew his trumpet, and hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down upon the earth. One-third of the earth was set on fire, and one-third of the trees were burned. I know that many of us were very concerned about the wildfires in California and, and, uh, you know, those, those times that there was fires in Bastrop. I mean, these are very small, isolated events compared to one third of all the trees. Can you imagine the amount of heat, smoke, and destruction from these, this fiery hail coming down? One third of the earth was set on fire. One third of the trees were burned, and all the green grass was burned. Now that's going to be a problem for the cows and the horses and stuff like that, isn't it? 
No more grass, no deer. The deer and the bunnies, and nothing. they don't have anything to eat. The second angel blew his trumpet, and a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea. So now the earth is affected. Now the sea is affected. Can you imagine all these tsunamis that are coming? It's destroying these coastal towns. It's destroying, it says, one-third of the uh, ships were destroyed. Then the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from the sky, burning like a torch. It fell on the other rivers and springs of water. Man, nothing is left untouched. You got the earth, you got the plants, you got the ocean. Now the lakes, the rivers, and the streams are now affected by this bitter water. Bitter water, people were dying from drinking the bitter water. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and one-third of the sun was struck, and one-third of the moon, and one-third of the stars, meaning that there's so much catastrophe that it's going to be darker and darker longer have you ever been to Alaska, you know, in the, was it the summertime? It's, no, that's where there's more light. Alaska in the wintertime, it's like dark all the time. That's how the whole world will be, just enveloped in chaos and in darkness. Whew, man. Verse 13 sums it up. Terror, terror, terror. To all, look at this, all who belong to this world. Let me ask you, Christian, do you belong to this world? Are you not of this world? This is what the Bible teaches us. As believers, we've been called out of the world. That's what church means. We've been called out of the world. We're not citizens anymore, Paul says. We're citizens of heaven. Our citizenship is now in heaven. Our citizenship is, we're, we're just passing through. We're just pilgrims passing through. Our real home is in heaven, and so we don't belong to the world. We belong to the Lord. And so those that are so caught up in the world and they get left behind, uh, yeah, you're part of the world, so enjoy it. Enjoy when, when, when God takes his hand off, and, and then that's what life is like without the Lord. So it's a very stark contrast. It's very uh, shaking to anyone that's here on the earth that's left behind. And like I said, a lot of people will actually look up and begin to make some changes, and then people will, will turn to the Lord. Uh, one missionary that had been a missionary for years said this about people. He said, Pe I've seen in my many years of missionary work, I've seen people that uh, they're very open in two times. One time as a, as a child, children are very open to the Lord. That's why we have, it's important we have kids' ministry, Kids are open to the things of God. And another thing that makes people open is destruction. When there's destructive things going on, it causes a lot of us to begin to look up and seek the Lord during these times. So this will be an opportunity where some will turn to the Lord. Unfortunately, some will not. The tribulation can be avoided by receiving Jesus. That's the good news. Receive Jesus, and you can avoid this. As he told the church there in chapter 310, I will keep you from this hour of trial that will go on to the whole earth. As it was in the days of Noah, I'm going to come suddenly and take some, and there will be sudden destruction that comes. You want to be with those that are taken to be with Jesus. Verse 20 of chapter 9 says this, but the people who did not die in these plagues, think about that, all this stuff we've been hearing about, they did not die in these plagues, they still refused to, y'all help me out, what did they refuse to do? Repent. To repent. Repentance. This is a word that we don't talk about enough, but it's so, so important. Let me read to you how uh, Matthew's gospel starts this whole movement of the kingdom of God. It says that there was this guy by the name of John the Baptist. How many of y'all heard of John the Baptist? Y'all heard of John the Baptist? It says this about John the Baptist. That he came, and this is what he began preaching from the wilderness to the people. It says, repent of your sins, turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Sounds like what we just read, right? They need to repent and turn from their evil deeds and turn to God. So turn away from our sinful activities and not just turn to alcohol or turn to something else, but we turn to who? We turn to the Lord. So we turn away from our sins and we turn to the Lord. So that was John the Baptist's message. Jesus, he had a similar message also in, uh, in Matthew 4. It says this, that, that Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God. The kingdom of heaven is near. You see the pattern? John's messages 
messages, repent, turn to God. Jesus' messages, repent, turn to God. We have the same message as a church today, don't we? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not what? Perish. Perish. That we are, we're going to perish without the Lord. We perish physically. We perish spiritually. Whoever believes will not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, Romans 3, 23. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is what? Eternal life. So it, it's, it's a choice that we all have. And unfortunately, some people, even with all this chaos going on, they refused. In, in other words, they had made up their mind. They're angry at God. They're mad at God. I'm refusing to ever turn to the Lord. And that is sad. They refused to repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. See, that's why that God is being slow in, in, in coming back. In, in the rapture beginning, because once that rapture begins, it's like that domino, and everything is like falling into place rapidly. This is what 2 Peter 3 says. It says that the Lord is not being slow about his promise to return, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. God is patient for your sake, because he's not wanting anyone to perish, but he wants everyone to repent. So why isn't God coming back sooner? Well, he's patient. He's patient for our sakes, and he doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to what? Repent. So this is the the message that we have as a church, is that we realize that I am a sinner, and I need a Savior. I am involved in things I shouldn't be involved in. I'm going to turn away from those things, and I'm going to turn to God. I'm going to turn to Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the one who gave himself to pay for our sins. I'm a sinner and I need a savior. I have done wrong. Jesus pays for my wrongs. He pays for my sins. What I deserved, he took upon himself. And so as we move into this time of communion, that's exactly what we remember. And so you can go ahead and take out your elements and and start peeling that top level. And and we're going to remember that upon the cross, Jesus made payment for your sins and mine. And what we do is that we repent and we turn from our ways and say, God, I need you. Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. And we recognize what Christ has done. Luke chapter 22. This is what Jesus says. He says, uh, he's in the upper room and it says that he took bread and he gave thanks to God for it and get the bread out to his disciples He took the bread and he broke it, meaning that that symbolized his broken body upon the cross. It says in Isaiah 53 that the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his stripes, we are healed. And so there's a substitution taking place. What I deserve, Christ took. So Jesus says this. It says that 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 night, that Thursday night, he took the bread, he broke it, and he says, this is my body, which is given for you Do this in remembrance of me. So let us pray before we receive the broken body of Christ, which represents what he's done for us. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice upon the cross. We thank you for your body that was broken upon the cross that pays for our sins. Lord, we thank you that by your stripes, we are healed. And today we acknowledge that we need you, that we are sinners in need of a savior. And we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your humility. We thank you for taking our place, that the punishment, the death that we deserved, that you took upon yourself. And so today we remember you, we thank you, we praise you, and we receive what you've done in faith. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. He says, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It says, after supper, he also took a cup of wine and he said, this is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out for you as a sacrifice for you. 
So what the blood of, of Jesus does, it says in the Bible that there, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And so the blood of Jesus has like a covering effect upon us, and it makes us, it cleanses us, it makes us whole, it makes us clean, so that when God sees us, he doesn't see our sin anymore. He just sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So we've been washed, we've been regenerated, we stand pure and, and clean without blemish before Almighty God because of what Jesus has done. And so the old covenant had to do with the blood of lambs and goats. The new covenant is in Jesus Christ. And so we receive this payment and this covering for all of our sins through Jesus Christ. And so would you join me as we pray for the cup that Jesus offers? Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you so much for your blood that was shed for us. Lord, that uh, we stand before you without blemish, spotless, without stain, radiant, a radiant bride before you, dressed in white, Thank you so much for your covering, for your blood, for it being poured out for our sins, paying for our sins, redeeming us, buying us, purchasing us, making us your own. We rejoice, we remember, and we thank you today, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. He says, this cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out for you as a sacrifice for you. Amen.